Hi, I am Val Harrison, the Practically Speaking Mom. Today we're going to look at time-saving strategies for busy homeschoolers. I am a mom of seven, four girls, three boys. I've been homeschooling for 21 years, and um, we have graduated five of our children from homeschooling, so that means school is still in session for a 10th grader and a 5th grader. Let me show you a picture here of them. This is my family. Um, you can see the three boys in the middle there, and they are the three middle in our family. We have two older daughters. They're both married, two grandsons that you can see there, and then two younger daughters. Also, my oldest son has, since this picture, gotten married, so this picture is missing our daughter-in-law. Over on the other side, you see a black and white, the black and white shot. That is of uh, when my children were all in my home, the, the souls that God entrusted to my husband and I to raise, um, seeking to really help them to develop who they were created to be individually and uniquely and designed by God. And let's see, I have a remake picture here then eight years later. Now, I have written a book called Wearing All Your Hats Without Wearing Out. I've written some other books too, but we're going to actually be looking at a portion of this book today, and that um, this book focuses on finding your focus for your family to be the masterpiece God intended it to be. That is what we want for our family, and for the individuals in our family, we want them to also be, be becoming who God designed them to be. Now, there's four parts to this book, and we're going to spend our time on the second part, Manager of the Monkeys, and I'm not talking about your kids when I say that. But before we jump into Manager of the Monkeys, I want us to take a quick look at the concept of Master Gardener because it's really important for us to lay some groundwork first. You see, we're going to be looking at household organization and homeschool organization and how to make it all work effectively so that we can really focus on the things that, that are really most important, which is not all of those systems. Those systems are just there to help us be on efficient, efficient with our time so that we can focus on what matters most. Now, what matters most? Well, that's where master gardener comes in. And being a master gardener means that we as moms are tending our, our children, which is sort of like our garden. They're plants that are growing and that takes time. We're not gonna see instant results in the effort we put in. I know you already know that. And, uh, you know, there's blooms that we're looking forward to, but along the way there's weeds we've got to pull out and there's some hard work we've got to do and we've got to be consistent with that hard work before we see the harvest, before we see the beautiful blooms. And that's what you're looking forward to, I know. And it is a wonderful place when we start seeing our kids blossoming in the different unique ways that God designed for them. But to get there, we want to be sure we're focusing on the one who did design them and helping our kids to focus and tune in to God's will and to God's voice. And so to do that, we really want a home atmosphere that is tuned in, that is without as much chaos as possible so that we can really hear his voice and so that we can enjoy the moments while, while we also learn all that he has for us to learn. So manager the monkeys, what do I mean when I say that? I'm really talking about all those pesky, pesky ob obligations that are on our back so much. They're just all those monkeys that are um, constantly there, like meals and groceries, laundry, clothes and shoes, home and school projects, finances, bills, budgets, house cleaning and chores and schedules and calendars and their education and extracurricular activities too, not to mention, you know, so these are the, the monkeys. These are the, the things that we just want to get organized with. This is not a list. Notice some things that are missing, such as relationships, because relationship, that's where we really want to be able to be focused and taking our time. So the more we can get systems in place that help us to go on autopilot with those obligations so that we can zero in on really making the most of our moments in life, that's where we want to get to. 
Okay. Now, mom, that list that you just looked at, I know you feel like that is everything you're supposed to do, but I want to tell you, it is very important that you just be the manager of that list, not being the doer of all the things on that list. You see, there's four negative things that happen when mom tries to do everything. The first thing is you don't accomplish what God has intended for you to accomplish because you're busy doing other things. You see, Ephesians 2.10 says that your God's artwork, all of us are, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. What does that mean? That means that he has specific work he wants me to do today and specific work he wants you to do today and specific work he wants our kids to do and, and our spouse and the other people around us. You see, sometimes we feel like we're supposed to do it all, but if we're doing it all, we aren't really focused on those things that he really designed for us to be sure to do. Others don't accomplish what God intended for them to do because I'm doing their things if I'm trying to do everything. I'm doing their things when he really intended for God to do, when God really intended for our kids to do some of those things. Another negative thing that happens when mom tries to do everything ourselves is trying to do everything keeps you or keeps me at our worst. I'm sure you've experienced that before. You say yes to too many things and you're spread too thin and you just can't juggle it all well. That's when you're not at your best. And then you realize, hey, this is too much. I need to back off. And you start saying no to things and, and that's great. And you look for your balance there. You see, we just weren't designed to do all of it because some of those things are to be done by other people. Now, also trying to do everything for your family makes your family and the individuals in your family weak. Yep, I know you think you're trying to bless them and help them by doing their stuff for them, by doing all of the chores and all of the food, meals, and you know all of that list. Now, there's some things on that list only you can do, but there's a lot of things on that list that are really there to help your children grow strong in a many ways. So while you may feel like your mom job description is to do everything, your role is not to do everything, but to manage everything. So what do we do with all these monkeys? Well, there's four things. We're either gonna delegate them or do them or dump them, and some of them are gonna be left undone. So let's look a little closer at that. With the things that we're gonna do, we need to keep a to-do list. We'll look at that more carefully in a minute. Then there's other things we need to delegate. Some of those things our kids can do, or maybe some others that God has designed. We'll talk about that more too. Dump. Some of the list needs to go away. And so always being prayerful and evaluating what really shouldn't be on this list anymore. What do we need to get rid of? What are things that I've been feeling as obligations that shouldn't even be there at all? And then there's other things that just need, are there going to be left undone? And so I have a daily prayer with that that I'm going to share with you. Um, sorry, that other slide got out of order. Um, so this was, I'm going to share this, the, there's a prayer on this page here coming up, but this was January 1st, not January 1st, the first day back to school after New Year's um, a couple years ago. And so you know that first day back, it's Christmas break is done and you didn't even feel like you really got the break that you needed. It was busy and you're still tired, but you feel all these things are starting back up again and it feels a little stressful. And that's when God gave me this prayer. What God says, about, well, we've already talked about what God says about our time and what it should look like. God provides enough, now this is the truth that I want you to see. God provides enough time for me to accomplish every good work that he has prepared for me to do today. So here's my prayer. Lord, give me passion for your purposes in this day and peace for the things you don't want me to get done. So this has become my morning prayer each day. I want to back up for just a minute 
sorry, you're gonna have to look through these. Okay, habits for time management. This specifically is about your to-do list, okay? So what I have found to be really helpful with the things that I put on my to-do list is to put a little label by all of them. And you'll come up with the labels that are most effective for you. Here's a couple of mine. C stands for any call that I need to make. So I would put a C by all of those. And when I get a, a little spot of time where I can make some calls, then I'm gonna see all my C's and I'm gonna call all those at the same time. And then E, I put an E by everything, like I need to send an email to this person. I maybe need to pay a bill online. You know, just um, maybe I need to print off something for one of the kids or um, I need to enter a grade you know, whatever, just your list of electronic tasks, you can put an E by all of those so that when you get a spot of time where you can do something on your computer, do all the things on your computer that need to get done. So that goes by a lot um, more efficiently. And O stands for out and about. If I put an O by all of the things that I knew, need to do all the errands I need to run, then when I'm getting ready to leave the house, I can look at my list, see all the O's, make sure I have everything I need to achieve those errands, like stopping by the bank, for example, or grabbing my grocery list. If I have an O by all my to-do list items that are out and about, I can make sure I put all those products in my bag that's my out and about bag, and I'm ready to go. Okay, the next thing you see there is delegated things. So the things that have been delegated, I put an initial by that. Those initials there stand for Nathan and, and Becca and Emma, for example, okay? So these that means if one of my sons gets home from work, let's say, and then I'm able to glance at my to-do list and see all the things by, um, by his name, and I can say, hey, let's quickly go over the things that I have for you to do. I like to give, if they're older, I like to give them a sticky note, especially so that there's a little bit less, um, less bossing from mom and let the, let the sticky note be the boss, the bossing or the nagging part of it. Okay, what's that next thing I have on there? That says, eat that frog. And that is from a book called Eat That Frog. And you know, it's just a little thing that's very helpful. And actually this book is a super easy read and would be great for you to have your high schooler read. But anyway, Eat That Frog is just a little concept that I've found to be very helpful in helping me to do better with my time. And that is with my to-do list, I want to star my top six things. What are the most important things that I get done today? And then of those six things, what thing is the one that I'm dreading most? And I want to circle that because that one, that's my frog. And if I'll eat my frog first, then I'll get my list very efficiently done. But if I don't, then I tend to avoid my to-do list. That's the concept of that book. And it really has made a difference for me. Okay, the next thing on there is touch things once. Now I learned, I, I was a Mary Kay director for several years and enjoyed that. And I learned a lot of really good time management things from that. Uh, in fact, the Eat That Frog book was a recommendation from that. But they had something called the Din Din Club, and it stood for Do It Now, Do It Now. And that means that if you have if you have a mail, for example, I wait until I really have time to deal with it, and I get all of all everything I need together to be able to do that mail effectively. And I'm going to touch something once. So I've got the trash can handy. I've got a pen handy so I can write on on the item, what needs to happen with it, so I can file it right then or put it in the bills basket. Uh, I'll write on my bill calendar right then. Do it all right then, and that's touching it once. So I haven't fumbled through it three times and, and moved it from one stack to another for, the, for a week before I really deal with it. Let's just deal with it once. Let's, let's wait to touch the mail until I'm ready to tackle it and do it once. And what this does is it saves me a lot of time. Okay, the 100% habit. That one is about um, being all in, in the different things that you do. You know, as moms, because we feel so many obligations on our back, we can feel very scattered in our mind. And you wanna develop the habit of really focusing on doing well the thing that is in front of you. For example, if I am typing 
And one of my kids needs something, they're going to come and stand by me, put their hand on my arm, for example, to let me know that, that they need me. And, or, you know, maybe they'll say, Hey mom, do you have a minute? And I'll say, give me one minute or five minutes or, you know, whatever. Um, or yes, I can right now, but I want to give them my attention and be all in with them. Or if I'm making a phone call, as I have listed here, I'm going to say a quick prayer first, God, help me to be what they need me to be. When I call them today, help me to hear what you want me to hear so that I can, can really, um, be the hands and feet of Christ to them on this phone call. And so that's an example of being a hundred percent, really being all in that is modeling to our kids living life abundantly. And that's what I hope that some of these systems will help you do. Now we've got to jump through these real quick again. Sorry about that. All right. Steps to hand off a monkey. So we're going to delegate some things. I showed you what to do with your to-do list. Now let's look at delegating steps to hand off a monkey effectively. Delegating tasks is not about making life easier for you as mom. It's about growing your kids abilities, character and work ethic, teaching responsibility, building self-esteem based on accomplishment and capability, equipping our kids with success habits for life. These are the reasons why we want to delegate, um, delegate some things to our kids. And it's important that I tell you this because you're going to have a temptation, a little lie that's going to pop into your mind from time to time telling you, oh, that doesn't seem very nice of you to be asking them to do that or expecting them to do that. And you can do that for yourself. You don't need to ask them to do it. But the fact is, it's important for them to learn these things. You are blessing them as you teach them how to effectively um, have good work ethic. So let's take a look closer at this. How do we do it? We're going to delegate. This is another little important trick, um, not trick, but important um, philosophy. Delegate jobs by assigning them to the youngest one capable of doing a job. Always ask yourself when you've got this item on your to-do list, who is the youngest one in our family that could handle this? And so by giving it to them, and we're going to teach you how to give it to them in just a minute, but by giving it to them, you don't overload the oldest one. You don't want to do that. This is, again, this is not about what's making it easier for you. I know it's easier to delegate to one of the older kids that already knows how to do stuff or that is more reliable, but you want to be developing character qualities in all of your children. So don't just focus on those ones that already have those, those character qualities down. You focus on the ones who don't have it down yet. All right. So we're going to do four steps here um, in the first part there of take the time to deal with the details. We're going to show it. This is, this is, let's, well, let's use this example. I have a picture here of, of toothpaste. Let's say that you're teaching your little one how to brush their teeth. Now, the first thing you're going to do is show them by letting them watch you brush your teeth. You're going to talk about, okay, we take the toothpaste tube and we put this much toothpaste on, and then we put the lid back on the toothpaste and the toothpaste goes over here. And so, you know, you're going to go through the brushing process. And when you're done, this is how you rinse. This is how you top it off. This is where the toothbrush goes when I'm done. This is how to clean up my spot where I'm going to look, did I spill anything? Did I make a mess that needs to be cleaned up? I'm really going to show them, teach them with a lot of talking. This first, that's the first part. Okay. The net, then I'm going to watch them. So they're going to take it now and, and you're going to be talking it through, do this step. And so you're telling them every little bitty thing as you go. And then now the next day you can say, okay, let's do this again. I'm going to watch you. Let's see how much you can remember without me talking. So first I showed them I did it. Then I watched them while I talked. Now this third time, I'm not going to tell them the instructions. I'm going to watch them and praise them as they do things right. We want, we want to praise them to, to continued good, uh, excellent, um, standards. Okay. So then repeat. What do I mean by that? 
Well, that means I need to keep praising them and keep noticing that they're doing it right. Okay, now the second half of all this, that was the first four parts there of taking the time with the details. Now the second part of this is you want to always be in the habit of following up with your kids on their chores and their obligations and responsibilities. In fact, I, especially when I had a lot of littles in the house, I scheduled time for follow-up on, on things. Okay. Now that I just have two, I, I don't need to schedule it. I have, I have, it's a pattern for me. It's built into my habits. Um, but also I don't have as many of them to manage. So it's easier for me to, to follow up on those things without it, without it in my schedule. But you're probably going to need to start out by literally scheduling follow-up every day. And so that might be easiest for you to have everyone doing their chores at the same time. And so you are going to first, on, they're going to be doing their chores while you are training this one in their chores. And then you're following up on everybody else's chores and chores and checking how it went. So when you do follow up with chores, you want to have a standard of excellence. You want to praise what you want repeated and you want to have pro appropriate consequences. So standard of excellence, that means if you have a low standard when you follow up, guess how well they're going to do every day. They are not going to exceed your standard. They're going to barely meet your standard at best. It depends on how you're following up in general. So go ahead and have a high standard, of course, coupled with praise. And it can be, you know, a, a loving, cheerful attitude from you, but still a high standard. And then praising what you want repeated, as I said, appropriate consequences means not harsher than what is deserved for that, but also not too little. If they have been adequately trained and you know that you gave adequate training for that child's ability level, then if you don't have some consequences, then again, they're not going to probably keep doing it. And so consequences are not about you being angry or you being frustrated. They're about, well, this is the next step when a standard hasn't been met. Clearly, you need how to need to know how to do that well. So if your job was to clean the bathroom sink, I'm going to have to have you clean a couple more bathrooms, to have a couple more bathroom sinks uh, to help make sure that you got that standard raised before we're done today. So that would be an appropriate consequence. Now, there's an important part of all this and this is gonna save you so much time if you can get this down. And that is learning to value your words so that they listen the first time you say something. How do you do that? How do you get them to listen the first time? Well, you have to really mean what you say, okay? You have to value the words that come out of your mouth. And here's the ways that we're gonna do that. You wanna be calm, clear, and consistent in the things that you say. Okay, you have to mean what you say or don't say it at all. For example, if you say, no, don't do that, and then they do that, well, did you really mean no? Because if you meant no, you need to take an action. So let's say you have a Todd, um, a crawler, and that, I mean, you know, a child that's just at crawling stage. And let's say that they, start, they see an electric cord and they start crawling across the room to get that cord and you say, no, mom says no, and they keep right on crawling. Well, you need to jump up right then and you need to grab them and take them back to something else and say, no, mama says no to, to electrical cords. Okay, so did I punish them? No, but I did take action after the first time. If you will consistently take action after the first time you say something, if they don't, if they're not following through right away, then you will, you will be valuing your words and they will also learn to value your words. So say it once and then act. All right, let's look a little more at this. Think before you speak and make sure you're really willing to enforce your words after the first time you say it. If you're tired and they're tired and you all just got home from um, a co-op day or um, a day, a field trip day, then are you really gonna enforce what you're about to tell them? If you're not, 
then just don't even say it. Remember, because the importance, it's so important to value your words. Make sure your child is really listening before you start talking with eye contact. Eye contact is so important to you bringing value to your words. And also, if they're little, like the picture here, then you want to get at a close proximity, okay? That will also help increase them having your full, their full attention on you. Slow down to give your words the attention they deserve also, okay? Um, give clear instructions that are reasonable for your child's age and ability. Don't just rattle off you know, a list of things that they're not capable of remembering all of it. And then you be frustrated then that they didn't do it. You've got to, to get more disciplined with how you speak. Make sure your words are matching what your actions are willing to do and what you're really expecting and going to enforce with them. Okay, this is also very effective. Have them repeat back to you what you asked them to do while you continue to make eye contact, ensuring that neither of you have an excuse to renege on this, that neither of you, see, both of you will understand, hey, we made a commitment to this is the plan. Now, once they reach a certain age, they're not going to want to repeat back to you anymore. And that's fine. You just need to tell them, you get to stop repeating back to me as soon as you are reliable in following through with the things I tell you to do. So it's completely up to you at what age you get to stop repeating back what I am asking you to do. So that's really helpful. All right. And then hold to compliance to your word, even when it's inconvenient for you to do so. You really have to be committed to this, mom, if you want your kids to start obeying the first time or listening to you the first time. In fact, just stop and think for a second. How much time would it add to your day if you only had to tell your kids something once and then they did it? Now, I'll bet that there's a lot of you who it would literally add another two-thirds of your child mom time um, available for other things or for each other in, in better ways than just repeating and getting frustrated and, and nagging and and them learning to get used to experiencing disobedience. Systems for simplicity and self-discipline. Okay, so what's the opposite of us having to give them consequences is them being self-disciplined. And, you know, there's a lot of areas of your life, of your family's life, where self-discipline will gradually grow. And one of those areas actually needs to start out really tight and and very careful. And that is internet usage. So this is a great one. If you have kids old enough that they're able to use the internet um, systems, uh, uh, if you can give them, um, okay, let, let's say, sorry, I'm stumbling with my words here as I'm thinking this through of how I'm going to tell you this. Um, when I determine how I'm going to have a system be at home, then it eliminates a lot of wasted time because I'm set in my mind. This is how we do it. For example, when we're driving home from co-op, it's been a long day and we all have a lot of stuff. They, in fact, our girls have two backpacks. They have a computer bag with, with the computer related books in it. And then they have their other books and they have a, a lunch bag. So three bags that each of them have, maybe a jacket. They're going to walk in and have shoes. And so all of this stuff, well, I have a rule and I remind them on the way home, hey, we're almost home. When we get home, what do we do? When they can say, we completely empty out our bags, including our lunch bag. We don't want to come around the next um, week for co-op and find that we have some half-eaten apple in the bag, right? Or a half-eaten sandwich or whatever. So it's part of our system when we first get home that those lunch bags get cleaned out and all the other bags too. Everything gets put away, their shoes, their coat, everything gets put away before they are free, okay? So they're going to put all their things away and they're going to come and tell me, hey, it's all done, okay? So that is a system that frees up our time so much if I have enforced the system with them, right? Okay, so I'm just going to tell you some systems that have really freed up our time. And one of those is an internet usage agreement. This is, you can't really see it here, but I have it available on my website. So be sure and go to my website. You know, I didn't tell you I'm a blogger. So I have a blog at um, 
at practicallyspeakingmom.com. So, uh, you know, on the internet world, I'm known as Val Harrison, the Practically Speaking Mom, or I do a lot of speaking for different conventions and um, events, um, mom's retreats and things like that. Val Harrison, the Practically Speaking Mom. My website is practicallyspeakingmom.com, and I have a podcast that is Practically Speaking Mom, colon, Intentional Mom, Strong Family. So, but you can just find it by looking up Practically Speaking Mom, or you can just go to my website because I do have a link to my podcast on my website, practicallyspeakingmom.com. Also on my website is this internet usage agreement. It is $2, however, I um, do have a coupon code that goes along with this, which I've, I've made this video for a certain homeschool convention. And um, in your swag bag items, you will see a coupon to make this free. So the internet usage agreement. And this is, a, this is the one and only um, main agreement that I and my husband and my kids each sign. I do have one other one for overnight um, at camps, okay? But this one is what's on my website because most, if we have kids old enough, then we need an internet agreement. And what this does is, this we both signed on the bottom line, we know exactly what the expectation is. They don't need to come and ask me 50 times, can I have an exception in this way? Or can, can, can this be it today? Or they can, or a child who tends to not ask and just does, well, we've made it really, really clear when it comes to the internet, because honestly, I truly believe that while the internet is great and fabulous and has so many wonderful tools and resources available to us through it, it is also the most dangerous thing in our home. I truly believe that. I mean, life and death of our soul, life and death of our body, um, the, our emotions, um, from bullying to encouraged to be to suicide to all kinds of things that the internet is is a very serious tool and it needs very serious attention and so an internet agreement has cut out a lot of time out of our lives because I'm not waffling back and forth oh I'm really tired so sure I guess I'll say yes right now or sure my rules are will lighten up right now because I'm tired or because we've been disagreeing about something else and so I don't want to say no to you but I've already had to say no to you that other thing no this way it is all set in stone okay uh, so you maybe we'll find benefit from, from using mine. But at any rate, the point is that systems help us free up time because we're not using time waffling back and forth on what our plan is. We've got a plan. Dirty dishes is another example. What are our kids supposed to do with their dirty dish? If we have a plan for that, we don't have to talk about it anymore. It's established. We just need to be a mom who follows up with what the plans are. Now, as I'm giving you all of these ideas and plans, please don't, don't feel stressed to go home and implement all of these tomorrow. That's a disaster. Implement one new thing at a time. So you're gonna have all of my slides that you can look at later. Um, this video will be available on YouTube permanently on my YouTube channel, Val Harrison, The Practically Speaking Mom. So um, you, you're gonna have access to this. You can come back to it. Don't try to implement all of it at once. Decide what is the most important thing. I would start with uh, really getting, bringing value to your words as the most important thing first. Okay, uh, here's another example. Laundry, what's the laundry plan at your house? At my house, we, I start getting them involved in laundry very young, and then by age eight, they pretty much can do their laundry all on their own. Again, I'm still following up um, I'm still praising things. I'm still giving necessary consequences as needed. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm following up consistently, but they have been adequately trained, most of them by age eight. Let's see what else here. School record keeping. This is one that I also train them to do um, from early on. So, you know, with a little one, it can be putting all of the, they can have a popsicle stick of, all of the different activities for the day. By little, I mean like a preschooler. And they could pull out a popsicle stick and, and let's read on it what it says. Okay, it's done, awesome. I get to move it to the other jar, to the done jar. So that would be an example of a very young 
teaching them to start keeping track of their school day, okay? And then as they get older, that school record keeping increases until pretty soon it's all on them. I'm just double checking. So uh, we'll, we'll look closer at school record keeping in a minute. Preparing the night before, um, you know, with, with co-op. Um, I have a certain day that all of their co-op homework is to be done. And then I have a certain day where, you know, the, the day before, after supper, nothing else is happening. We're, we clean up supper and then you're to get all of your co-op ready. Get your bag packed, show me the outfit you're going to wear, um, get a shower, you know, all of these things, preparing the night before, getting their lunch made the night before. This reduces stress. It reduces chaos. And guess what? We can hear God's voice and we have time for the God moments in our day when we have less chaos in our home. Um, a chore chart is another thing that can help. In fact, Usually I would have a chore chart uh, twice a year. It would get changed so that for, it would last six months long and it would change because we just need to enjoy the work we do too. And change helps that some. And there's so many great ideas on Pinterest for different chore charts and things. Okay, this is something that really helped me a lot. I hope that you find it helpful. I took three notebooks and actually I have more now, some, ad, some other categories as well. But these are the three main ones, and these are permanent records, okay? Don't think of this as like a bill calendar where you've kept track of bills and then you're going to file that every year. Now, this is a permanent record thing that can help you because you can look up the past. Um, for example, the, the mom book for education, let's say someone writes, uh, tells you a free website that is good for making their um, bibliography page, okay? And you want to remember that. Well, I would write that website and what it is on a sticky note, and I'd put it in my education book. And why do I do a sticky note? Because pretty soon you're going to find, hey, I've got five resources for bibliography page. I could make a whole page of this book that is that particular topic. So the fact that it's on sticky notes allows me to manipulate it that way. Now, I know what you're saying, all of you young moms. You're like, what in the world are you doing this on paper for instead of in a computer or on your phone? And uh, it's just because I started these habits before electronics were so advanced and things. And so this is how I do it. And maybe you're a mom that likes hard copies of things also, or maybe you're not. I've had lost too many things through electronic stuff, but it's because I'm not all that great at tech stuff. So maybe you'll do the same thing, just an electronic version, and that's great. But household things might be a recipe for um, a natural cleaning, pro um, you know, making a solution at home that you don't have to buy whatever product again. Or um, household could be, I'm going to call around to find the best uh, price on getting the dishwasher fixed or getting the roof replaced or whatever. And again, I'm put doing it all on sticky notes. So I'd have a sticky note uh, maybe with this roofer's quote um, or whatever. So I, so that I can have a whole page of roofing information, or maybe I, um, uh, I, I was looking for a dentist and so got information and from this person recommended somebody and all that. I always put it on sticky notes so that I can change around my, my lists in the different categories as I, as those categories grow. And then meals and groceries, you know, that one's got some handy stuff. Oh, I forgot that I was, I already had some stuff pulled up here for you. Here's some examples. Uh, so we're down on the meals and groceries. I make a lunch sticky note that, okay, every day, at this is an example, that Mondays is chef salad, Tuesdays is sandwiches, Wednesdays is a hot meal because everybody's, you know, got different places to go Wednesday night for church. And so the evening is chaotic and we'll have a cold meal in the evening, a hot meal for lunch. Um, Thursday lunch, chicken salad, Friday lunch, frozen pizza um, or flatbread pizza that we make ourselves or whatever. But so I would have that on a sticky note and I have that in Mills and Grocery book. And that way, a year from now, uh, I can look back and maybe by then I've had, and so, well, for, sorry, this, I have this on a sticky note and that's what I'm going to do for maybe three months and then we're tired of it. Well, I can look in my book and see what my lunch plan was 
two years ago, for example. And so I'm able to see those different ideas. I'm not reinventing the wheel every time. I'm using the past effort that I put in to help me prepare for the next one. Okay, for the, for the next month or the next three months. Um, I have a vitamin info list for different health issues like that I've learned that this vitamin is good for this and uh, that kind of thing. Or what did I serve for holidays or when company came? I've got it on sticky notes and then I'm able to just, you know, look back there. So I'm, again, I'm not trying to think up new plans. I already have some plans. I might as well use them again. A grocery shop, a uh, price shopping comparison that, that I keep in that book, a standard shopping list for each store. So if I'm going to be going to Sprouts or Aldi or Walmart or Costco, I can glance at my standard shopping list to see, you know, these are the items that I normally get from there and what, what do I need today? So these are some of the things that I would keep in these different books. And so that's an example there of some daily lunches from, you know, schedules from the past. Okay, here's another system that I do. Now, I am not a, I'm not a lesson plan mom uh, when it comes to, when it comes to um, my homeschool planning. I am a raising a Luke 252 kid mom. And so I'm going to tell you what I do. This is the planning that I do. Instead of lesson planning, I just use the lesson plans that come with each curriculum. Um, or maybe I'll, for math, I'll say it's one lesson a day. And that, you know, that's the lesson plan. Um, so I don't, I don't invent my own lesson plans, except I have some in history. And so um, I, I'll show you that in a little bit too, if we have enough time to get to that. But here's what I do spend time on twice a year. And this comes from a Bible verse, Luke 2.52. Jesus grew in four areas. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and favor with man. And so I pray, I spend some time praying about these four areas with my kids. And, and then I pick out one key thing that I really want to focus on this semester that I see some significant improvement academically, physically, uh, in their relationship with God and in their relationship with other people and, and how they treat others, or it could be a specific relationship that needs to be improved. So I get one goal for each of these things. Now, I, so this is a goal poster that I have. It's just, <clears throat> it's something you can get from me on my website, laminated um, on just a, it's eight and a half by 11. Can you get a drink? <clears throat> Sorry, it's eight and a half by 11 and it is laminated so you can write it and erase on it. So you can have one for each kid and the instructions are on the back of different ways that, that you can help you figure out what these four things could be, or you could have, you could get your kids involved in making this um, plan as well. That four things that you're going to be praying about these four areas for that child, you're going to be keeping a watchful eye for opportunities that God may bring up to help this child grow in these four areas. So I really allow this to shape our semester in a significant way. Okay. Um, record, a records binder or flash drive of these things. This is for homeschooling specific now. Calendar, I actually just print whatever our local school district's calendar is for the year, and I put that in the book, and I make that, and that way I know what the rest of the school district is doing, and I roughly make that my calendar as well, then I don't have to make one, and I know that I'm, you know, they, if forever, if, if ever for some reason um, my records were questioned, they can't really argue with a calendar that the school made. And so that's why I choose to use it. Okay, I also keep each child's schedule uh, assignment records. We'll look a little closer at that in, in a minute. Some sample tests or all tests, um, or you could take pictures of them and you know download it all. Field trip list with the date and address and pics or pictures. Um, picture of the textbook covers and table of contents. Sample workbook pages, homework or writing pages or you might want to keep all their writing papers um, just because. 
a list of the ways that of volunteer work that they've done, the dates, addresses, supervisor contact info, description of activity. If they're in high school, you definitely want to be seeing if that supervisor would write them a recommendation letter and then also a syllabus. Uh, and again, I just use the syllabuses that come with curriculum. All right, so one of my main things about all, um, for all of my kids, I have really focused on mastery of a subject. And they I'll just interject here. So I've graduated five. All of them were accepted at every college that they applied to. Um, four of the five got great scholarships. Um, some of them full ride, some of them not full ride, but just um, for sure um, strong, scholar, strong scholarships for that particular college, okay? And I don't say that to brag in any way. I just say that because I believe in mastery of a subject, mastery at each step. So not feeling pressure to get things done at the the rate that someone else says, but making sure they know each step well, especially in math. Math is critical that they understand thoroughly the step they're on before they move to the next step, or it's just going to get weaker and weaker and they're going to tumble pretty soon. So especially math, you want to be tight and strong and solid on each step before you move to the next one. With other subjects, it's less important. If, if they don't learn um, ancient history well, it's not going to affect how well they learn American history. Or if they don't do awesome in biology, it's not going to affect especially how they do in chemistry. It affected some, but not near to the extent that, um, that math needs to be mastery. So let's take a look. Well, let me go back for a second. Checking schoolwork with mastery in mind. So let me tell you how to do that. I, and this also will save you a lot of time, okay? Um, they get done with a math assignment. And so they will, um, usually with math, I have them right there with me, okay? I'll grab the, the answer book and they have their book in front of them and I have the answer book in front of me and I just have them say number one, you know, and they say their answer, number two, and their answer, and I'm listening, they're talking, and then I'll tell them um, number three is incorrect, mark that, and we'll keep working our way through and so we've checked it all. Now I can see how many they've missed and so that helps me know the plan of action of what we should do next. If they just missed a couple, then we're going to go back and we're going to work through those. Well, I might have them work on them individually. If they just missed a couple, it was probably an error, you know, a computing error or a not careful error. And so I'm going to have them do it again and, um, and then we'll check again. Or if they missed a lot, then it means they are not understanding, right? And that means we need to go over the lesson. And, you know, that's one of the great benefits of homeschooling is that when, when we're checking the work and seeing what they missed, and now this tells us what we need to work on, that's awesome. Versus if they're in a classroom and they get their paper back maybe the next day, um, at, if lucky or maybe it's two days or something like that those students might not even look at what they missed so if you don't look at what you missed did you learn because what you what you know that doing that assignment is just a reflection of what you already know but I want to see what they don't know and that's what checking does it helps us see what they don't know so that that's what we can work on and that's why it's so important also, the sooner they can, I, I want to check that work with them right then. Checking it right then helps the wrong information not stay in their head. It, this process of them checking with me, it helps them instantly know, whoa, this is how many I missed. I don't think I'm getting this material good enough. Or, hey, I'm, I'm doing well. I just have this one or two to correct. So anyway, the way that um, I would strongly encourage you, especially in math, to do mastery and to check things right away. That's also really helpful in language as well. That's another one where it builds on top of each other. Okay, simplifying subjects. So reduce, simplify subjects to reduce time and increase retention of information. So I just talked to you about math. History, writing, and literature. This would be the one thing that sometimes I will make lesson plans on. And what I'll do often, 
or what I've did a, done a lot of years is we'll get out a timeline of, a, of history, a time period in history. And we'll look at this and see the things on the timeline. And then I'm like, guys, let's pick out what we think is the top 10 history items that happen in this time period. And so we'll pick those out and then we'll start focusing on those. I like to get audio from, from the time period. Um, so that means mystery of history, uh, story of the world, the, uh, Diana and Waring. Those are three great ones, but uh, Wall Builders with David Barton, he has great stuff. History.com has good things as well. Um, I, I prefer the first four that I told you over history.com, but I do like history.com. Uh, Drive through history. So there's lots of great audio and video things that can, you know, audio things they can listen to while they're, for example, drawing something from that time period, like using the books, uh, draw through history. So they can be drawing something, a picture they're looking at and they're drawing it. And um, while listening to the audio stuff, um, we'll often watch some videos over lunch based on that history event and or we'll talk about current events that might be going on right now or in the news that are related to that time period as well. Lap books are awesome for the younger kids and I'll get the three the trifold boards and we'll often do a lap book put the putting the different parts on the trifold board so that everybody can participate in the same lap book. So I'll just buy one lap book for you know whatever maybe we'll say the Civil War okay and so littles can be coloring on some parts of the lap book middles can be writing the the you know a little bit more difficult stuff and olders can be writing an entire paper on the the same subject and then we're putting it all on our trifold board so that's a way that we can incorporate all of the kids incorporate history writing and literature um, Voice of the Martyrs, Focus on the Family, Citizen, and Student Daily App are three sources for current, current events or magazines related to that. In fact, Voice of the Martyrs is free. Uh, that's a free magazine. Focus on the Family, Citizen, I think is $10 a year. That's two, two great sources. Oh, and there's another one that's another good source for current events, and that is Decision Magazine by, um, is it called the Billy Graham? It's Decision Magazine, and I don't remember the exact name of the organization, but it might be the Billy Graham organization, something like that. I mean, I know who Billy Graham is, but I don't know the name of his organization, and he has passed away. Um, but anyway, um, his organization is still going by his son, and now his grandson, too. Okay, so anyway, I love to incorporate those three things together. Um, right along with that, IEW, Institute for Excellence in Writing, they have time period writing books. And so I'll often use those right along with this as well. Um, another one that can go well is Diana Waring has um, book history books that history curriculum that is a lot of fun uh, because it focuses on the four different um, uh, um, audio listening, uh, auditory learning, visual learning, and kinesthetic learning or movements learning and so she incorporates all of those different forms of learning into her history and it will have a good reading list for literature uh, and I enjoy doing that a lot so anyway I do like to combine those three subjects one to give us some great family time together and make it fun for all of us two it it makes it less feel like book work and workbooks instead of more active learning and let's go on field trips about the subject that we're doing and there's no reason why all of us can't be learning just at our different levels on the same material okay science experiments together like i would the, we would whatever subject the oldest was supposed to be doing it was fun to have the youngers just um, like he would do the experiment and they could watch and he could be teaching why, why he's doing what he's doing in the experiment. And so the littles are learning from that, but he is learning a lot because he is teaching it. So anyway, that's some ways to incorporate um, the multiple ages there. Um, I love Shirley English method. You can definitely put together multiple ages, not all ages in one Shirley English method. Um, 
grade year, but you can definitely at least combine three years. Like if you had an eighth grader and a sixth grader, you could do grade seven and it would work just great with both of them. Or if you had a first grader and a third grader, it's a little bit harder there because um, the first grader is a little bit young for Shirley English method. But anyway, you can do some combining there. I love spelling phonetic zoo. It's called phonetic zoo and it is spelling. Uh, I love it. It's mom's no time for mom because it's a little 15 minute. Um, it's all on CD for them. And it is really quality stuff and it's enjoyable for the kids. I have, my kids have enjoyed that spelling more than any other spelling I've tried. And I've tried a lot of spellings. I also love word roots, especially for older kids, high schoolers, even. Um, so those are some of my favorite in, in grammar. All right. Um, lists to make before making a schedule. This is the other thing I do instead of lesson planning. I believe there's actually some more critical things to be figuring out besides the specific lesson plans. Like what places in the home can I set up a variety of places? One, so that it stays more fun, but also because the different types of learning happen best in different environments. I want to set up a reading area and I want to have a place where we do family learning. And I want to have a place where our alert learning happens like the dining table for math, for example, or, or maybe another kid doesn't work well if anybody else is around and he's going to be more alert in his bedroom at a desk, you know, let's set up spaces that are effective for learning. And anyway, if I have a, you're going to be able to see these slides, but also I have a packet um, that is available on my website. It's 12 pages long and it's how I set up. It's my systems for homeschool success. And it is, uh, like I said, it's 12, uh, 12 pages. I don't remember how much it costs, four or $7, something like that. Um, but it goes through all these things that I've been telling you about our homeschool. I'm going to skip some of this. Okay. This would be a sample schedule. So I color code a schedule because I want to make sure I've got some group time going on. Like the first thing, all the, the yellow here is group. Um, the pink is things with me that they need to be with me to do it. And the green is active movement things because this is, this particular one is for a younger kid that honestly, I really think movement is super important with all of them, even up through high school, um, having some movement breaks in between subjects or every 20 minutes. If you look at studies, um, you will find that people who take a break every 20 minutes retain more information. And so be sure you're plugging in those breaks in there. But let me just give you, show you this a little bit closer. So listening while eating breakfast. I love a website called cross7.org. I'm telling you, mom, you will be amazed how much your kids learn on this website without any effort from you. So it is um, seven categories. It's these little memory songs in seven categories. It's um, math and Latin and grammar and science and history and um, Bible hymns. I know I'm forgetting some things. So anyway, there's really super short little song that, that teaches a new thing in each one of those categories every week. Okay. So it'd be eight little bitty short songs that are videos on this website. And so maybe they're listening, they're learning, um, maybe the square roots, uh, for example, or, um, in science, they might be learning about a particular scientist who invented a particular thing. So these really tiny little short songs, they watch seven of them or eight of them, however many categories there are. And so that's eight little videos while they're eating breakfast. It literally takes less than 10 minutes, but they're going to listen to the same videos every day that week. And it's that week's new songs, that week's eight songs. Okay. And later in the afternoon when they're doing cleanup, or um, playing with Legos or, you know, whatever you want them to be doing there. I just have mine listen to previous weeks in the afternoon. So they're getting some review in the afternoon. They're learning the new stuff in the morning at breakfast. And by the end of the year, you will be amazed how much they learn. Now that site does cost. And so it's a subscription, 
but I have used it for many years and loved it. Uh, so then the next thing on there is family priority. I'm going to, I, in, in my systems for homeschool success, you will see, um, how I determine my, my family priorities. Okay. But one of them is devotions and people skills. Okay. Those are top priorities in my home that we make those two things a really big deal. And so I'm going to schedule some time for that early in the day like that. And then we've got a moving, you know, movement, which morning chore, brushing teeth and getting dressed. Those are all things that need to happen but it is movement. And so I'm scheduling it so that it can be effective for brain, um, brain breaks. Okay. And then math, I've got math early on because I want a time, the, their most alert time of day, and I'm going to have it at their most alert spot and it's going to be with me. Okay. So this is just an example of how I, um, schedule their day to, then to be effective for all of those different aspects that I've talked about. Um, the slides are going to show you some more examples and then here's, so, um, this is an elementary student's, uh, record. Okay. So this is a Monday here and they're just checking it off unless it's something that like, um, at 8:55 and spelling, they did lesson nine and it looks like they got eight out of 10. Okay, so they, they put that record information, less than nine, eight out of 10. Um, down where it says 955 math manipulative, that's the, um, I like to use um, wrap ups, but there's some other math manipulatives I like to use too. And so I just have them spend like, you know, five, 10 minutes a day on some different math manipulatives. So this is saying that they did the time five, um, learning wrap up. Okay. And then the next thing there says extramath.com. That's a, just a free website to, um, to work on their math facts. So that's showing that they did that. And then for reading, they read page 10, uh, seven to 10. Okay. So this is them learning to keep some of their own records. And I am following up with that throughout the day. If they're ready for lunch, I'm going to be looking at their list first and making sure that they've got their records in place. This is another example. This is a syllabus that was made um, by the company. And I think this was a science. Yep, this is science. And so it's biology. And all she did was go through and write down the date she did it, it checking it off that it was done unless it was something that had like, there's a test. And so she put the, the percentage there. Okay. Which we checked the test together. And again, I'm following up on all of these things, but she's keeping the records. So she's learning to be responsible. Um, so this is teaching textbooks, um, keeping track of her grades for that. Okay. Um, this is another quick thing to help you with. Remember, we're doing time-saving strategies for busy homeschoolers right now. You may not be able to do once a month cooking. I used to do once a month cooking, um, but then I found this to be more effective, less, less stressful to me. Um, and so what this is, is one hour a week where you buy a bulk amount of meat and you make one of these things and then you divide it up into different bags in the freezer. So you've got a bag, uh, a freezer full of these different bags of the meat step done for a meal. So like a, a raw mix of beef or turkey, ground beef or turkey, frozen onion, pepper blend, eggs, oats, tomato paste, salt and pepper, mixing that all up, dividing it into bags. Now I'm ready to go with meatloaf or meatballs. Um, browned ground beef or ground turkey with frozen onion, pepper blend, divide it up into bags in the freezer and it's ready to go to use for various things like um, spaghetti sauce, for example. Okay. Browned ground beef or, or ground turkey, frozen onion pepper blend. Um, once it's browned, add in cooked beans. Now I'm ready for a whole different kind of thing like chili. Okay. Um, so anyway, these are ones that I did. I just found that once a week, one hour, once a week, helps me get the main portion of the meals ready to go, save time that way. So moms, here's some of the things that we have talked about um, 
today. We talked about raising a Luke 252 kid. That's available in two forms on my website. Either you can order laminated posters from me or you can just download um, that on your computer. Down below that is the book, Gaining Momentum, Preparing Your, Son, your, Preparing your Student for a Career with or Without College. Um, that, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure why I put this on this page because I don't think we talked about this today. Wearing all your hats without wearing out, finding your focus for your family to be the masterpiece God intended it to be. Simple systems for homeschool success. So your homeschool things are in my packet that you can download um, on my website, practicallyspeakingmom.com, or all the household organization things. That's part of my book, Wearing All Your Hats Without Wearing Out, which is available as a, a book on my website or as an ebook on my website. So you can take a look at that. Then there's a little picture there of the internet agreement. Um, so the, also available on my website. These are some different ways that you can connect with me. You know, what is not showing on here is that I have a private Facebook group called Intentional Mom Strong Family. And that's the same, you, you see that phrase on my um, podcast there, pra Practically Speaking Mom Podcast, Intentional Mom Strong Family. Well, Intentional Mom Strong Family is my private Facebook group. Join that and you'll be able to have dialogue with me um, throughout, throughout the week. And then once a week, I have the, the podcast to also help you. And so wearing all your hats without wearing them out, I just talked about that already. When Littles Are Loud, this is a book that I have on how to get littles in a system and get them scheduled to help them with their independence so that they're not as cranky, uh, to help them, them with their creativity and confidence and obedience and bonding, all of these things in, in my book. Um, then this is a different one. And actually, this is a workshop available on my YouTube um, uh, on my YouTube channel, Val Harrison, The Practice Speaking Mom. Or if you're watching this as part of an online convention, then this workshop will also be available there. But this is a book and an ebook. <coughs> Clash in Your Home, A Game Plan for Cleaning Up the Conflict. That's my number one heart's desire is that families will learn how to have healthy relationships. All right, included, um, gaining momentum includes the following sections. Uh, a path for high schoolers to, to head to college or to, to head to career. Um, um, power steps and career habits is about positioning your student for success in the real world. A success portfolio, how to put one together for your high school student or have your high school student put it together. And then the fourth section is about relationship, that navigating the parent and young adult relationship, which can be so tricky. And so that's part of that book. So all of these are available and more available on my website, uh, practicallyspeakingmom.com, practicallyspeakingmom.com. So thank you very much. I've enjoyed spending this time with you. God bless you and your very worthy journey of homeschooling.